Hi. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone for coming to this session, a Resilient and Responsible AI. I am your moderator, Arisa Emma, uh, from the University of Tokyo, and I'm really happy to uh, be here uh, with the brilliant panelists here. Ho however, uh, in this session, I would like to uh, be more interactive. So what I would like to uh, present uh, is just like uh, 50 minutes or so, and uh, uh, there's uh, another uh, colleagues or the panelists here. Uh, uh, I here, I he's, uh, it's called Orihime robot, and uh, there will be two uh, Orihime operator. We call them pilots uh, to kind of share their experiences, and uh, maybe that will uh, kind of broaden our uh, discussions today. And uh, uh, we also have uh, three, four panelists here today, and uh, they, they have, uh, they, I asked them to make some of the comments to regarding this topic. But uh, I think uh, uh, what we wanted to discuss is uh, more open to the public or the open to the audience. So I, we, I welcome uh, your comments, your, uh, your suggestions, or uh, your opinions uh, towards this topic. So um, let me start uh, with some of the key uh, concept that I would like to raise here. So, yeah. So, um, the resilient and responsible artificial intelligence. Um, actually, this uh, topic uh, came out uh, with the discussion uh, from uh, the, uh, the international the colleagues here, but also uh, mainly uh, today's slides was made with uh, me, myself, and uh, uh, Kaji san. Uh, he is. Uh, from Toyota Motor Corporation, uh, but he's today wearing his academic hat. And also, uh, Kuribayashi san uh, uh, there, uh, he's a student uh, of the University of Tokyo. And uh, here uh, today, what I would like to raise is the how we can extend the AI governance uh, to a more uh, broader way. So I, I think uh, in this today, these days, Internet Governance Forum, Lots of discussion has been uh, done uh, regarding the AI governance. Uh, yesterday, I, I was at the, uh, the I was at the moderator of the Hiroshima AI process discussion, and that was also the discussion about the how to uh, make uh, the 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 international collaboration or the interdisciplinary collaboration uh, regarding the AI governance. Uh, and uh, of course, that kind of governance discussion includes uh, the topic actually we wanted to discuss today as a resilient and a responsible AI. Somehow, uh, I think uh, uh, we can um, maybe distinguish these two uh, to become more uh, high resolution or, or more more kind of concrete uh, discussion about the resilient and responsible AI. So here, uh, this is kind of tentative uh, division of what we consider as a responsible AI and a resilient and responsible AI. So as a responsible AI, uh, we can consider the environment for each AI system can be assumed as fixed or as given. So we know what kind of AI systems we are talking about. And also we can expect uh, the behavior and the value of each, each, each AI systems. Uh, and uh, that kind of uh, behavior is uh, relatively obvious. So we use, uh, so we, we can name the AI system for the AI system for the agriculture, AI system for the facial recognition system, so that, that kind of thing. Uh, and the third uh, I uh, issue is that the basically a fixed number of actors are expected to take responsibility for, e for each AI system. So we can uh, identify who will be the responsible person. And the Hiroshima AI process is actually discussing like the code of conduct or the principles and then the developers or the, you know, the deployer, the users. So we can actually locate who will be the actors and who, and we can discuss the potential uh, risks and also maybe the, uh, the uh, responsibility uh, who, who, who each actor can take. And uh, also actors are expected to establish and to comply with appropriate rules uh, regarding the principles such as like uh, privacy, fairness, accountability, and so on and so. So that kind of thing is definitely important. We need to have this kind of discussion. However, uh, with the responsible and uh, uh, the resilient, uh, resilient and responsible AI, uh, I wanted to uh, kind of look into more uh, background or maybe the, the connection between the environment or the society as a whole. So uh, these days, uh, for example, we still face uh, lots of crisis. Uh, we, we all know from looking for the news, uh, there's a, a huge earthquake in Afghanistan and also we, there's a, a big uh, uh, battle or, or, or it's on still ongoing uh, all over the world. And uh, we, we need to think about how AI uh, can 
uh, support uh, the people who are actually faces that kind of difficulties. And also, uh, we also need to consider how those AI systems can be uh, really vulnerable to those crises. And uh, you know, we can consider that uh, the, those technology uh, to restore or recover from that kind of disaster. However, at the, the exact moment, when the you know the batteries are gone or when the the electricity is gone, we cannot use all the all the all the, all those things. So the AI blackout may occur. So here I am not discussing like the existential risk or you know far future risks, like the humans are taken over by the robots. It's not that future. We are actually facing that kind of crisis. Well, we we may have faced we we can we could have faced that kind of things tomorrow or even today. So that kind of thing, I think uh, we wanted to uh, talk uh, today. So uh, here, the crisis and social environmental changes with unpredictable or unforeseeable outcomes may occur. And uh, uh, also, uh, we, 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 can, uh, we need to think that the AI systems are used uh, not only by its own system, but uh, each AI systems are connected or maybe somehow dominated or monopolized by one AI, you know, the huge system. And uh, we, we call somehow, it's called like a systems of systems. Uh, if that kind of thing occurs, that will become a more convenient, more beneficial society. However, it also needs some kind of uh, uh, measures uh, not to uh, becoming uh, vulnerable. And we need to uh, be more, to build a resilient uh, society uh, as a whole. And uh, with that kind of a situation, uh, we need to more wider ranges of actors uh, to expect to collaborate, to take responsibility. And actors are expected to be more flexible and adaptable while adhering to the principle and the rules. So sometimes in the crisis situation, we cannot obey all the rules or the all the principles. Uh, we need some kind of flexibility. And, uh, and uh, in that sense, human has the most flexibility than the machines. We all know that. So here uh, is the somehow the model to consider resilient and responsible AI. So um, we, we, are, we are actually considering these three layers. So the layers with the, the human beings or the ind individual organization society. And the, the, the another layer is the systems, like the systems of systems. And the blue layer is the, the physical systems. So uh, here, uh, even though these layers are uh, divided, uh, we wanted to have, uh, we wanted to discuss with these three layers interacting uh, between or the within, and uh, also the values enjoyed by humans through the systems can be manipulated and improved as much as possible in responsible to various events and changes occurring inside and outside the system. So this is actually the model, but uh, uh, with all these models, I think uh, it's not, you know, enough uh, to consider. So I would like to uh, kind of um, show some of the cases that we are actually uh, considering. So, for example, uh, in the case of crisis, uh, people with uh, disabilities or people who need special support uh, may uh, uh, need some kind of uh, uh, different uh, system of the, the support, actually. Or if we become too reliant onto the technology, and uh, as I said, if the AI goes black, black out or the electricity are gone, then we, we don't know. We, we actually do not have uh, any means uh, uh, to uh, you know, uh, c continue the our communication or maybe our society. Or uh, as I told you, uh, if uh, systems are dominated or monopolized by one or two uh, organizations, it may become very convenient society, but it also has the risks of becoming uh, systems of AI being connected to all. And uh, we actually face uh, uh, exact incident actually uh, uh, coming up from this kind of uh, uh, systems uh, uh, connected and with the multiple AI systems. And uh, needless to say, there is a disaster, uh, uh, the natural disaster or maybe the natural security uh, incident uh, can uh, occur at any time. So with that kind of situation, we need to consider uh, not only the, the normal procedures of the AI governance that we can expect what comes next or what may be the potential risks, but uh, with this kind of crisis environment. 
So um, before opening up to this panel discussion, uh, I would like to introduce uh, one of the uh, operator's pilots. Uh, his name is Kari, uh, Kari-san. So hello, say hello. <laughs> And hello. Uh, <laughs> hello, yeah. So um, this is the robot called Orihime, uh, developed by uh, the uh, engineers uh, called uh, Yoshifuji Kentaro, uh, Mr. Yoshifuji, and uh, he has also. Uh, uh, when he was a child, he stayed in the hospital. As he, but he also wanted to need the connection with the other people. So his the main concept of is Orihime is the another self. So not uh, AI, so he's not AI. So not AI replacing human beings job or work, but uh, with this robot, he can expand uh, his ability or maybe his work options. And uh, now he has, is at the IGF uh, forum, <laughs> <laughs> IGF. Uh, so, um, so Kari-san, uh, could you share your experience regarding this topic? Uh, and. Uh, so, Kari-san, お話をお願いできますか? So, he will speak in Japanese, but uh, there will be the translator, so you can hear his voice, and uh, you can understand by hearing the translator. So, Kari-san, お願いします. <laughs> Hi, hello. My name is Kari. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Hi, I'm now operating this robot from my home in uh, far away in Tokyo. So I'm happy to meet you, all of you today. Thank you for your time today. <laughs> uh, but I can't speak English. So <laughs> okay, so uh, what I want to tell you is about the evolution of technology. <laughs> uh, English is uh, that's all. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would you like to have an uh, interpreter. あ、こんにちは。え、私は首の脊髄を損傷してしまい、手足に麻痺があるので、え、約5年前から車椅子を使って生活をしています。I have been living in a wheelchair for about 5 years now because I have a spinal cord injury in my neck and I'm paralyzed in my limbs. え、現在は自宅からこの分身ロボットオリヒメを操作して Currently, I operate an avatar robot named Orihime from my home, working as a cafe staff, a cafe staff member. え、このリモートワークは物理的に移動する通勤時間がありません。なので限られた時間を有効に使えるので、日常生活や so remote work eliminates the need for the physical commute. So allow me, allow, allowing me to use my limited time effectively and have been able to balance my daily life and rehab. rehab. はい、障害を負ってしまい、再びこの社会参加できるかどうか不安でしたけれども、このテクノロジーが進化している今の世の中には本当に感謝をしています。I had concerns about being able to reintegrate into society after my disability, but I am truly grateful for the evolving technology in, the, in today's world. はい、そんな中、テクノロジーに頼ることが当たり前になっている今の生活の中で、私が一人で対処できないことが起こりました。However, in this era where relying on technology has become commonplace, I actually encountered a situation that I couldn't handle my own on, on my own. はい、それは落雷による停電です。あのリモートで仕事中、落雷による停電が発生しました。それと同時に1階にある分電盤のブレーカーが落ちてしまいました。um, it was a power outage um, due to the lightning. While I was working remotely, a lightning strike caused a power outage. And at the same time, the breaker on the distribution board on the first fl floor tripped. Uh, 
停電になってしまうと、1階に降りることができず、分電盤のブレーカーを復帰させることもできませんでした。I used the stair lift to go upstairs to work in my room.、Um, my work room、uh, is on the second floor. So when the power went out, I could not go downstairs and turn the breaker on the distribution board back on. The shop of the Bunshin Robot Cafe was a remote set of books that were going to be a little bit of 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 a l i t 停電復帰後に聞きました restored, workplace, Cafe, worry, そして自宅では家全体が真っ暗のまま夜まで家族の帰りを待つこととなりとても不安な時間を過ごすことになりました。And in total darkness, I spent my very anxious time at home, having had to wait until night for my family to return home. The convenience of the modern world and the, and the evolution of technology are truly remarkable. And I hope that it will continue to evolve endlessly. So, the problem is that the technology is not going to be able to do anything. The problem is that the technology is not going to be able to do anything. But on the other hand, I need to keep in mind that there are cases in which I As a person with a disability, cannot respond smoothly to unexpected situations if I rely too much on technology. And this is where the power of people and empathy becomes necessary. And I hope that the world will become a place where analog thinking and technology can coexist harm,、um, in harmony. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Kari san, for a very impressive、uh, speech. And、uh, Kari san、uh, will leave here, but、uh, the another pilot will come、uh, soon. So, Kari san, arigato gozaimashita. Arigato gozaimashita. Goodbye. See you. <laughs> Okay, so、um, while、uh, waiting,、uh, another pilot came out.、Uh, I would like to uh, continue uh, two, two, three more、uh, pages to discuss this、uh, concept of the resilient AI. And、uh, one of the、uh, key、uh, The、uh, key concept that、uh, we can、uh, tackle on this、uh, is the agile governance, I guess. So, this is the concept that the govern Japanese government、uh, raised. And、uh, also, I think the, like the World Economic Forum also uh, has uh, the, the similar discussion as well. So,、uh, in the, the concept of agile dif 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 governance discussion,、uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, Ways uh, to uh, implement uh, this governance way. And in one sentence, t h e y actually mentions about、uh, the when we face the crisis. So here it says the difficulty of predicting and controlling results. So I, I'll just read the sentence because the behavior of AI and other elements that make up、uh, cyber physical so system is difficult to predict. And these elements interoperate in a complex manner. It is often extremely difficult to predict and control the results projected by the cyber physical systems. For this reason, we must build governance mechanisms that are based on the premise that these systems are difficult to predict and control. So that is important, and、uh, that we, I think we all agree. But how? So that's the question we would like to talk、uh, today. 
so maybe as a countermeasures, uh, we can take a lot of things. So as a technology, uh, I wouldn't, I, oh, I want to uh, read all, all the things, but uh, uh, I think uh, to to uh, uh, face uh, when we face this kind of crisis, uh, there's a lot of measures we can take. From the technology side, uh, we can have uh, uh, some kind of like the backup system, or maybe uh, we can uh, make this kind of uh, uh, system into the feedback loop and uh, uh, interact to uh, ma make the kind of more environment that interact with users or like uh, I mentioned in the agile governance uh, so the governance can take uh, all the roles uh, to make uh, to improve like the the general literacy the, the general public's literacy or the like the we can make the monitor the market so that it wouldn't be dominated by one big organization and that will be prevent you know the all the things going to blackout and uh, so th that kind of thing can be one measurement and as an individual uh, over reliance to the technology may cause uh, may uh, increase uh, the, the risk so uh, as we can uh, take uh, uh, each uh, one of us can take some of the uh, measurement and uh, so here uh, today's discussion uh, I will I am I raised uh, the three initial questions uh, but not limited to this so uh, everyone in this room are very welcome to raise some of the uh, discussion questions or maybe some case studies uh, that you wanted to share with us so uh, the question one is that are there anything else to consider and define in terms of the issue of thinking about the resilient society so the interaction between people and AI systems and the other is the second one is that there's if if you have some kind of specific examples you wanted to share uh, regarding this topic, uh, we also would really wanted to hear that. And the third is that what needs to be addressed by each stakeholder and what needs to be discussed by the multi-stakeholder in order to become a resilient society and to address the crisis. So um, uh, with that discuss uh, discussion point, uh, I wouldn't like to uh, consider uh, in your, uh, uh, while you are thinking about uh, your comments, your opinions, I would like to invite another pilot. Uh, Yui-san, can you hear me? Yui yes. Sang? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe camera son. Uh, so here's the Yui-san. Yui-san, camera watch this. Hi. <laughs> Hi. 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 Okay, so uh, Yui-san, uh, we would like to hear your stories. Uh, so the floor is yours. Onegaishimasu.自己紹介を少ししてください. Hello, my name is Yui Higashikawa. Nice to meet you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yes, yeah, I will speak Japanese. Uh, nice Hi. to meet you again. And yeah. えっと、私の名前は東川ゆいと言います。えっと、未熟児で生まれて、えっと、脳性麻痺による思思痺で幼少期からクロマイシカと送っております。現在では折姫パイロットとしてリモートワークで働きながらより良いリリースと一人暮
people to interact and work with others without being bound by location, time, weather, and even uh, um, physical circumstances. Uh, one of the good things is that um, using a powered wheelchair allows me to overcome even the small bumps or ir irregularities. So this has significantly increased my range of movement and extended my um, distance uh, that I can travel. And like water dispensers and similar devices, they are so easy to operate and user friendly for everyone, and they are very convenient to have for me as well. え、今の世の中はそれに関するマニュアルとかあとは基盤の絵が溢れていますが、様々なことを想定しての出演とか編集とかは追いついていないように思えるので、いざとなった時にどうしたらいいのかわからなくなってしまう、困ってしまいます。when you rely too much on technology, um, the technology or the devices, there are plenty of manuals and uh, FAQs available, but actually the practical demonstrations and the training covering various scenarios are um, not um, kept up. So those leave us in the, uh, leave us in the trouble when the uh, sudden needs arises. うん、ありがとうございます。in today's evolving technological landscape, having internet access is taken for granted. And for wheelchair users, wheelchairs are expected to move without no doubt, with no doubt. So I feel that so many things are way, uh, so many things and a way of thinking are design technology centric. <laughs>困りごとを通関する出来事が最近あったので、シェアしたいと思います。で、ある時私は東京であの非接触対応のホテルに泊まったんですけれども、その時に非接触対応のホテルなので、人が フロントにほとんどいませんでした。何かあれば電話をかけてフロントまでスタッフさんを呼ばなければなりませんでした。so now uh, today I would like to share my um uh, my story experience. And one time during a long stay at the contactless at contactless hotel, the essence of the anxiety became clear. Um, due to its focus on contactless service uh, hotel, there were rarely any staff members at the front desk. So if anything happens and you had to call the uh, there's a phone and you had to call, and a staff member would come out to the front desk. But unless it was something significant, and it seemed like uh, they wouldn't handle it, they wouldn't ha handle it just over the phone. So that's how I stood the system at the hotel. 
このようなコンセプトのあのホテルとか場所では緊急ではないが個人が必要とするサポートを求めることはイレギュラーになってしまって通勤あのその業務のシステム上スタッフさんたちに負担になってしまうのではないかと申し訳ない気持ちになりました。So, in, in, under this concept of the hotel or the system, uh, Uh, the first source of my anxiety was that、um, requesting the support that is not urgent、uh, but needed by individuals like me、um, might be、um, considered irregular and might affect additional working shift for the hotel staff. And, and when that came up to my mind,、uh, I couldn't help feeling sorry for、uh, making them trouble. そして本当に緊急で一刻を争うような時はどうするのだろうかという不安が募りました。最先端のテクノロジーがあるからあの人件費を削減したりという利点もあると思うのですがそれだけでは対応しきれない場面がまだまだたくさん出てくるように思います。And、uh, at the same time, I was concerned that、uh, when, when what, what we should do or I should do when there is a truly urgent situation that requires immediate attention. And just, not,、uh, just having cutting it technology is not enough, but they should cover the situation、um, that could arise unexpectedly. So I think they'll. There will be still be more scenarios where it falls short. 災害などの緊急時にはもっとテクノロジーありきの想定が崩れるしテクノロジーがあるからこそアナログしアラノブな選択肢も充実させておくべきなのかもしれないと痛感しています。So, under these、like, disasters or the emergencies,、um, technology would be,、uh, play a good part, but also you should be uh, more、um, aware of the many scenarios and、um, that we all have to、um, respond to that and be、um, ready for those situations. And I want、um, everyone to understand these、uh, kind of real situations. ありがとうございます。これを踏まえて、こういう世界、社会になってほしいなというものを個人的に述べようと思います。えっと、テクノロジーか人の手か、どちらか一方に頼るのではなく、バランスよく共存活用できたらいいなと私は思っております。今が豊かで便利な世の中であるからこそ、その便利さが機能しない。場合のことも考えることが重要で、可能であればマニュアルの見える化だけではなく、実際に試行錯誤できる場がもっと増えると嬉しいなと思っております。So、to, to close my speech, I would like to、um, share my hope the how I want the society to be. And so, technology or human touch. Instead of leaning too heavily towards one or the other, I hope for the balanced、um, coexistence and utilization. And in a world that is currently rich and convenient, it's essential to consider what happens when that convenience doesn't work. If possible, it would be great to not only visualize manuals, but also have more opportunities for hands on experimentation. Thank you. ありがとうございました。Thank you very much. ありがとうございます、ゆいさん。So, um, uh, so uh, the pilots, uh, uh, thank you to the pilots, and we will、uh, now open up the, to the panel. And, uh, uh,
also, uh, I am uh, inviting one panelist, uh, Kitano-san, uh, on, online, but uh, I think uh, he needs some of the preparation. So maybe we can start with the, the f f panels on the floors and maybe uh, one or two comments to like, uh, people from like, uh, within like, uh, maybe just, just a starting statement. So that's just a two minutes each, and then uh, we, will, we will go to the Kitano-san. And uh, sorry, Kitano-san is only available until like a two, so maybe uh, we will give him the, the first shot, and then after that we can you know, continue this talk. So um, I will f uh, first I would like to uh, invite uh, Emma Martinez uh, from maybe, I, I would say Jipai, or maybe he she can self-introduce here. So Thank you, thanks so much. Um, my name is Inma Martinez. And uh, I have spent my life building products and services with technology and with AI. And I come from the school of human-centric service design. And that means that when I think of what tech or AI can do for a person, I put the person at the center. <coughs> and I build everything around what this person needs. And this is truly the value of the 21st century. So technology, architecture, engineering have built our entire civilization yeah, based on the Maslow pyramid of needs. First, we need food and shelter, then we need support from others, then we need to feel we're part of a community, then we need to express our hopes and dreams, and then we need to feel that we know who we are and we're happy with ourselves. Yeah, that's the value pyramid of a human being. And if you look at when human-centric began to be the value that we needed to uh, attain, it's only as of 21st century. In design, sometimes in the 20th century, when we design furniture or we design tools for cooking or repairing, we started to build them putting humans at the center by making them safe to use. So one of the examples I use to reflect this is when the teen opener was invented by the Victorians, in England in the 19th century. It was beautiful. It had like a dragon head, it was amazing. But it was so dangerous to use. Many fingers flew off, as well as teens were open, yeah? Not human-centric. The automotive industry spent 70 years without safety belts, yeah? and. When we look at what AI can do for people now, very recently the concept of let's make AI be created around the human needs, this is very new, as well as how can AI help us make life better and think better, but allow us to continue developing our cognition, yeah? so. This is where we need to put the emphasis. Not taking the human out of the equation, but putting the human at the center of everything that AI can do. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Rebecca Finley. I'm the CEO of the Partnership on AI. We are a global nonprofit organization with about 120 partners in 16 countries. And we focus on developing and deploying AI that centers people and society first. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I think these two stories bring together for me three themes that we often uh, approach in very different ways in the responsible AI community, but really are at the heart of thinking about this, both as a human-centered design, uh, but also as a socio-technical system, a systems that are interacting with the social and political and economic environments in which we find ourselves. So one theme that I hear is really around how do we design these systems to be 
uh, inclusive of all of the different perspectives of the communities that are both going to be uh, deploying the systems, but also, most importantly, impacted by the systems. And so this notion of inclusive research and design is a key theme in uh, the responsible AI community, and one that I think is we're only really just coming to understand, and we can talk about all sorts of examples when we've seen AI systems deployed that are not um, done in this way and therefore do negatively and uh, significantly impact communities, particularly vulnerable communities. Um, so I think that's one theme that I hear in this. The second theme is really around AI and economic inclusion. And I was thinking about uh, the perspectives from a worker that we heard in the first story and how uh, an AI system was able to uh, therefore provide for an economic opportunity, but how fragile and non-resilient uh, that capacity was. And so when we think about augmentation, uh, some people like to say some people's uh, augmentations are other people's automations. And so understanding that delicate balance and what that means to workers and how we center their voices. And then the third piece, of course, is safety. And that comes to this whole conference about what does it mean to be resilient? How do we handle and ensure that these systems that, as, as Arisa noted, are, are interacting with all sorts of other systems systems of infrastructure are in fact safe. And for those of you in this community who are actively engaged in this, you'll know that the whole question of AI safety has taken on a lot of profile um, as we see the emergence of these very large scale um, foundation and now potentially frontier models as well. Thanks so much. I'm um, David Leslie. I'm uh, Director of Ethics and Responsible Innovation Research at the Alan Turing Institute and a professor of Ethics, Technology, and Society at Queen Mary University of London. Um, I think my comments will uh, be a nice uh, compliment to those that have just been given. Um, I think, first of all, uh, listening to those two examples, we need to think of uh, resilient and responsible assistive technologies as uh, technologies that have to be human-centered and that have to prioritize uh, the enhancement and empowerment of human agency, autonomy, uh, in, uh, the integrity of, of social relationships, the integrity of um, interpersonal solidarity. And I mean, those, those are nice words to come out of the mouth, but the real question is what type of governance mechanisms do we need to make sure that that happens? And uh, on that front, I would say we need to prioritize the democratic governance of the technologies. So um, Orihime is a good example of how the, the, the va values-driven, values-led technology can secure um, a direction that we, we would all want. But unless we have a codified uh, requirements for impact assessment that start right at the very beginning of, of a path of innovation, um, if we don't have that, then we can't ensure uh, that, that we'll have the kind of foresight into, into the requirements for empowering humans through technology. And those, those impact assessment processes have to be um, stakeholder involving and include the, the voices of impacted communities. Um, second point that I wanted to make is a more general um, uh, observation about what, what we are thinking about when we think about resilience. So uh, resilience is a social phenomenon. Um, it involves uh, a robust social capital infrastructure. So a resilient society isn't just a society that's technologically advanced per se. It's a society in which science and technology is embedded in a strong um, and communicatively rich uh, societal infrastructure where there's public trust, there's social buy-in, there's uh, democratic participation in the technology. Um, it's also a uh, resilient society is also one where there's multidimensional readiness. So we have cultures of readiness where there's a, a sufficiently upskilled, both ethically upskilled and techni te technically upskilled citizenry so that the, the transformative effects of technology can, can be properly managed. And I'll just say that um, I in that sort of resilience as a so society-centered concept, then we can think about AI um, not in a, in a kind of tech-centered way, as one of the, the examples uh, spoke, but more in a way um, that sees AI as a set of tools that are utilized by societal stakeholders um, and that uh, 
that provides a, a so that that builds off of a social foundation that lowers the dependency relationship between the technology and people. And so, th three quick statements about that. First, public interest technology um, is tech is technology without technocracy. So, if we're going to build public interest technology, it needs to be technology that that doesn't kind of revert to. Um, a, a bureaucratic kind of structure. Second, uh, supportive AI solutions are solutions without technological solutionism, so they don't recur to, to, to sort of technology as the ultimate solution. And finally, and this was mentioned in the last example, that we need to think of a coevolution of society and technological affordances without technological determinism, right? So we need to remain in the driver's seat in, in, the, in passive innovation. And, and the only way that happens is if, as I was saying before, we have democratic governance um, first and foremost in, in the production of technologies. Thank you, panelists. And uh, I would like to um, uh, invite uh, Mr. Kitano, Kitano, Professor Kitano, uh, to make Hi. some of the comments on this uh, topic. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I uh, wish I uh, be in uh, uh, Kyoto, uh, but I have to fly out to the Washington DC tomorrow morning without prevent me from uh, being there physically. Uh, you know, the re reason, uh, I, I think this is a really important topic and, uh, you know, AI is getting even more powerful and uh, more influential. So the responsible AI, responsible deployment of AI is very important. And then uh, last week I was actually in uh, Stockholm uh, is attending the AI for Scientific Discovery workshop uh, funded by the Warren Bank Foundation, which is a you know major Swedish foundations. And then the uh, reason why I'm flying into the uh, uh, Washington D.C. tomorrow morning is the, the National Academy of Science workshop on the AI for Scientific Discovery as well. So like I, you know, uh, you know, one of the big thing coming is like AI will promote the science. Will AI scientists? <laughs> Uh, will be uh, one of the major things to come. And then, of course, the science is the uh, uh, one of the major things that driving a civilization. So I think like, uh, you know, we can see like the uh, next five, 10 years, a uh, major lab with that AI is not gonna be competitive. So AI, not just being a tool, but the AI uh, will have like a high level autonomy to make a discovery of the uh, uh, quality equivalent to the uh, Nobel Prize uh, uh, level discovery or probably even beyond. So we are discussing uh, uh, in the workshop that we should have like a very specific grand challenge like, uh, uh, you know, the control of aging or black matters, like a dark matters and uh, all, all, all kind of like a grand challenge uh, or like a nitrogen fixations at the very low energy consumption. You know, so those things that which we won't be able to solve by ourselves uh, could be, the, uh, you know, by the use of AI, we might actually fast track you know, making a solution for that. So that's extremely uh, important on the positive side, but at the same time, uh, any amount of use of such technology might have a catastrophic uh, implications. So I think that is very important uh, part. Okay, second part, which is actually, uh, you know, particularly that the Japanese community is facing is, uh, we're going to have like a major catastrophic earthquake coming within a decade or so. Uh, there'll be Nankai Traff, and then uh, there's like a, uh, periodically, uh, every like uh, I don't know, hundred years or so, uh, we have a catastrophic earthquake hitting the southern coastline of Japan, and then uh, that will be ten times more damage than the uh, uh, one off of the Fukushima, which is like a, a East Japan earthquake which took place in 2011. <laughs> so that we are bracing for that. And then uh, Professor Kamata at the Kyoto University, who's a seismologist, uh, uh, talking about the most likely uh, uh, 2035 plus minus few years. So we only have like a few more years to prepare for that. Okay, so if we have like an increased reliance on the AI, what happens if like those earthquakes took place and then uh, power goes down, servers goes down, I think we're gonna be completely blackout. And we won't be able to uh, rely on the AI for the survival of the earthquake or like a uh, following volcano erupts. Uh, Fast potentially um, uh, Mount Fuji, so like uh, you know, Tokyo will be unusable at that time. So I think like uh, we need to be prepared uh, for the major uh, catastrophic event, and then uh, uh, you know, AI requires the uh, uh, you know telecommunication line, the uh, stable power supply, and also like uh, uh, you know, PC or mobile phone to be uh, fully usable. And those assumptions will be. Uh, gone right away if we got the uh, major hit in the earthquake. So, uh, uh, you know, so we should really consider, uh, you know, a very powerful 
so like a uh, proper use in terms of scientific discovery and other thing and also like uh, how we're gonna hedge the over reliance on ai in case like our ai uh, cannot be uh used you know uh in a major aspect where you know total disaster uh you know so that can be uh uh, you know, one uh, message. I think we hope that the community to uh, pay attention. Well, thank you very much. And then I fly into the Washington DC tomorrow. We'll see you there. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know you and have, there. A, <laughs> have a safe trip. And uh, uh, we will yeah. definitely would like to meet in person in the next time. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank so you. <laughs> okay. I have. <laughs> so this this goes the first round of the panelists, and I, I think we uh, kind of uh, share the the we, we come up some of the keywords like not only resilience but also like a human centric or like automation and uh, how how to think about this disaster issue and with the case studies. So uh, like what Kitano Sensei Kitano Sam um, raised is like uh, the disaster issues, but uh, I think uh, the stories came from the pilots are uh, somehow similar. So even without the disastrous issue, we can face that, that, that kind of difficulties and uh, uh, depending on the situation uh, where we actually uh, are. So um, I would like to, uh, right now, uh, I, we have uh, more um, 30 minutes and I, I think uh, that's not enough, but I would like to open to the uh, audience and also to the panelists. Uh, so uh, if you have some questions or the comments, suggestions, uh, there's a microphone so you can uh, uh, make the line and uh, make the comments. And uh, while I, I don't see anyone uh, in the microphone, maybe I can you know, go up with the, this panel discussion uh, continues. So um, I, I think uh, I, I cut up for like uh, two minutes. So I think it all of you has a more w one wanted to say more. So if you have some uh, other comments, suggestions, I would like to go another round, but I think that um, it would help uh, if we defined what is resilient mm -hmm. and I think um, is a cultural value. So in certain cultures, your family, your school teaches you things that allow you to be a more empowered individual. So I have lived in Scandinavia many years and we all know how to go in the forest and make a fire and make a tent and that bears are dangerous and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But a Spanish person or an Italian person will go to the forest and eat the wrong foods and try to feed the bears and do all kinds of crazy things. Yeah. So if we want to secure our future, technology can be a tool, but the power has to be in our common sense and the values that we have learned from our families, from our school, from the culture of the country. And in that way, empowerment creates resilience. Nothing can bend you. Every challenge you shall overcome is a mind and an attitude set of skills. So. Technology and AI will build comfort around us and conveniency, but when something really huge hits, only your values, self-empowerment, your mindset will get you out of trouble. And we have seen it across every century. I'll, um, I'll pick up on the, the notion that I, that I ended with around safety because um, I want to get at the point that it's just critical that we continue to monitor these systems once they are deployed. I think so much of what happens when we think about the acceleration and advancement of AI as a new technology is what is sort of the latest emerging uh, technology and what are the new, the new applications. And we don't attend enough to once those systems are deployed in the wild, what is the impact that they are having and how could that differentially be affecting um, different communities uh, in, in that way. And I think this comes back to your point a little bit about um, governance and oversight, um, both in terms of, you know, is the product safe before it is launched, uh, which there is much discussion about right now, but also once it is launched, what systems are in place 
to manage and monitor it moving forward. Um, and so we've been doing some work over the last 12 months, bringing a community together around what does safety and responsibility look like, specifically related to foundation models and now starting to touch on frontier models as well. And having convened that community, so brought together industry, many of the AI research labs, together with civil society, together with academics in the space, um, we decided that the best way to approach an understanding of ongoing management and resilience of these new systems was really to go across the life cycle. So what needs to happen in research? What needs to happen in pre-deployment? what needs to happen post-deployment, and then what needs to happen in an ongoing and monitoring way, and what needs to happen when there is a major upgrade to the system as well, and how do you define that, and what does that look like? So that's thinking about all of those things, like making sure that it is uh, red teamed and secure and that that's an inclusive and diverse set of perspectives as well as what are the social impacts. How do we better understand, for example, the impact on the labor market but also how do we better understand the impact on the environment as well. And so trying to really think about sort of the life cycle of a system and what are the different ways in which it touches different communities um, and uh, how do we understand and monitor that in terms of making it safe and resilient? Um, I think it's just a, a core question in terms of how we move now forward. <coughs> so I think I, I just want to make a, a kind of high-level comment uh, about uh, one of the components of resilience that often doesn't sort of get um, brought to the, the forefront or center stage, and that's this idea that uh, if we think specifically about AI and machine learning, because a lot of the, the, the technologies that we're recognizing as, as making most progress the past few years are machine learning technologies, um, it's often not recognized that these systems are uh, data-driven, right? Uh, I say that, that's an important phrase, data-driven, because if you think of uh, the, the Latin word for da uh, data, datum, that simply just means the given, right? That's uh, in the Latin, uh, data means the given, datum is the given. And so if we have a society that is driven by AI technologies, it's driven by the given, right? It's driven by past the, the sort of past patterns that have been ossified in underlying data distributions that then become the basis of the, the kind of predictive capacities of these systems. And that's a really important um, point because first of all, a system that's data-driven uh, can, uh, can become brittle amidst a dynamic and changing environment. And, and Arissa mentioned this in, in, the, t in the talk. You ha if you have a, a world in which constantly things are changing, so think about our, our cultures and how our cultures are constantly changing with new ideas, new beliefs, new language, new vocabularies. If, if you have systems operating in those type of dynamic environments, they, become, they can become brittle and lack performance. Um, very, you know, very uh, soon after they're built. And we, so we need to make sure that we keep aware that these systems can be brittle and that we have a very dynamic and changing society. And machine learning has a limitation, a boundary in some sense where um, it, it will always try and be trying to catch up because it's driven by the given. Uh, second uh, point that's relevant there is data-driven systems will just reproduce discriminatory patterns, past uh, patterns of prejudice that are, that are baked into the data sets, right? So that is, if you will, a hard problem of machine learning, especially when you're processing social and demographic data, that, that biases discrimination and prejudice in a data-driven system, if not mitigated, um, will always be replicated, augmented, and entrenched by the use of the system, right? And so we need to understand that a resilient society uses AI and machine learning uh, as a tool, but in a bias mitigating and, and, and discrimination aware way. And then the final, and I think this is the most, the most big picture salient point, is data-driven systems are not systems that, that make worlds. Human beings in general have the type of agency that we have because we create and make new worlds, right, through our communication and through our innovation, right? The world that, you know, uh, Copernicus and Kepler navigated is a different world from the world that Einstein 
and, and Heisenberg and, and, and others in the 20th century navigated, which was a different world from that, that which Aristotle and Ptolemy um, navigated, right? We remake our world in virtue of our capacity to symbolically create. And that distinctive part of human agency um, is, is not data driven. It is driven by our creative capacity. It's driven by our capacity to, to imagine um, things that didn't ha weren't, didn't exist before. And so when we, when we think about our relationship to future technologies, we need to preserve some of that, that world-making agency that we have. Because if we, if we simply over-rely on data-driven systems, we, we will come to, in a sense, stagnate creatively. And, and so thinking of that component of resilience is very important. Because if we lose that um, agency of change, then we will stagnate as a species uh, in, in many ways that we, we wouldn't have even noticed if we weren't aware of it. Thank you very much, and uh, I think uh, the, the points that you raised, like the well, how how to consider the situation of the resilience, and uh, also the uh, ongoing di discussion on the safety and uh, the foundation model, the generative AI, and uh, also uh, uh, how 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 to uh, kind of think uh, not only from the tech side but also the society side, how our recognition and also how we see the society actually changes. So those evolving uh, thing, uh, I think, uh, we should be incorporated into this kind of discussion. And uh, I, 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 if someone would like to, uh, your comments or suggestion, yeah, please use the microphone mic. Hi, and thank you so much for all these different perspectives. My name is uh, Erin Kitsara, and I'm from IEEE. Um, so some of the thoughts, starting from the use cases we heard about, which are close to assistive technologies and the ways that emerging tech can have very useful applications for inclusion and accessibility, I think something to consider is not just what happens in case uh, you know, there is, um, uh, there is no, um, no person available or there is an emergency, but it's about also the, the option that we provide to um, this part of the society uh, to have a plan to opt out of this solution so that we ha consider this in our urban planning, that we consider this, that we have a more con holistic approach to uh, resilience and we don't just consider it, we have one single solution as a plan B, uh, and then we have the plan B technologies, but we have a more uh, resilience consideration in a more holistic way, giving more the choice and the agency of everyone. Um, a second point I, I was thinking about was the impact assessments, and we often have these impact assessments that are either tec technical impact assessment, ethical impact assessment, human rights hu impact assessment, and typically that happens with organizations which deal with each of these areas, and I think when we talk about resilience and about future societies, we have to have a more holistic impact assessments where we consider all these approaches so that we have a, um, more viable and sustainable solutions. And a third point, when we talk about dependency on technologies, I think we should not forget our skill sets. So if we consider it a given, um, the support we get from AI systems and other technologies, I think we run the risk of forgetting our, our core uh, skill sets, and this is something that we should consider designing our future societies. Thank you. Thank you very much. All, all those three points are really uh, important, and uh, even though uh, you, you kind of like uh, raise a good uh, point that the even though we focus on like a special situation or maybe in like a disastrous situation, uh, there, there's a lots of thing or the, the measurement or, or the risk assessment thing that the we uh, still need need to go on. And uh, yeah, so uh, if uh, Someone, uh, you wanted to add to the, the comments, or maybe I saw someone's kind of, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Hi, thank you all to the panel. Really, really insightful comments so far. My name is Jack Minty. I'm from the British Embassy in Tokyo. I had a question around um, how we talk about the resilience of AI in terms of critical infrastructure. Is it helpful to talk about AI as critical infrastructure? Is that a helpful lens to look at it through? Somebody did. <laughs> so AI runs on infrastructure, yeah? 
because it's a layer of service. And when you have uh, complexity and challenges that sometimes can be predicted, but sometimes cannot, because they create the a sphere of unknown knowns, the any any service running in society right now has an SLA, a service level agreement of going down to the core basis of the uh, of the you know system. So, for example, in telecoms where I used to work, if the whole network falls, you always have certain bandwidths that are still running. So, don't throw away your 2002 mobile phones that ran on 2G <laughs> because 2G is the best signal for a catastrophe because it is strong enough to go through uh, cement and walls. But 3, 4 and 5 are terrible. That's why when you go into an elevator, you lose the signal. But if you're on 2G, that goes through concrete. So. Because AI is a service layer above the hardcore, the real bones of the infrastructure, we need to create an AI that is what we call in telecoms uh, self-healing. So if this node falls, everything moves to the other node. And if that one falls, everything moves to the other node. And that is the way to create plan A, B, and C in within a network, within a system. And in human systems, when you have a disaster recovery, I was part of the uh, Fukushima disaster um, help that came from the UK. And we came with loads of personal Geigers that we gave to families because the only Geigers to measure radioacti radioactivity was the ones used by industry and the city, but families were worried about their children and the, the themselves. And we put them at the level of pets and children because radioactivity is heavy. And that was the best way to measure it. So let's create layers and layers of plants and self-healing mechanisms so that something falls, the next one is up. And that's how we can build resilience in the systems, but also in the people knowing what to do. I'll just jump in on this, on this question and uh, all those points are well taken. I think the challenge with saying, is AI a critical system, is that AI has come to mean so many different things, and there could be many different types of technologies or systems deployed in different ways. And so, um, you know, just like we need layers of resilience within the system, I think um, the best way to best understand how AI may be interacting within a system is to map the system and understand what the implications are. So, for example, uh, the work that I mentioned that we've been doing on foundation models, we did that to try to determine, because there's some who think regulations should focus on the outcomes and the applications, others who are questioning whether there should be some regulation of some of these large models themselves. Um, and so in mapping the ecosystem and deciding where there were different points of intervention and potential, we decided in terms of the work that we happened to be doing that we were going to fall, uh, focus on those model providers because we felt that they did in fact have an outsized impact on the entire ecosystem. So in our particular case, we decided that this was important work to happen in terms of standing up a voluntary set of measures around responsibility and safety, appreciating that regulation needs to come into force and needs to happen, but we need to do something in the meantime. So, um, so I really do think it's more complicated than just asking, do we, you know, AI more generally? We need to understand what, in fact, the interactions are. If I could uh, uh, come in on this, but maybe from a slightly different angle, which is to say, okay, the question is, is, is AI critical infrastructure? And I would say AI is fast becoming critical infrastructure. So one thing to remember about um, AI technologies is that these are general purpose technologies. Um, in a sense, these 
function in the world as cognitive surrogates, right, for thinking and acting people. And uh, one component of this means that uh, it cuts across domains, it cuts across sectors, right? AI applications can arise in, in variably any um, uh, domain of, of human experience. And as we become more connected, as we have the internet of things transforming into the internet of the body, transforming into the internet of everything, and you have smart cities, you have you know, smart um, bio detection, you have you know, smart um, other forms of infrastructure, we will increasingly uh, rely on AI as critical infrastructure. We are already doing so uh, in managing energy systems in across the board. And so what that means, I would, I would claim, is that AI is not simply a kind of general purpose technology, AI is fast becoming a kind of public utility, right? And not, not just the public utility in the national public utility sense, it's coming a, a global public utility, right? Because technology itself is, is global, right? The, the impacts are, of technology is universal. Uh, I think that one um, component that, then, that that raises, which is especially of concern, is if AI is becoming critical infrastructure, who controls? the infrastructure on which AI runs, right? Who controls the data infrastructures? Who controls the compute or information processing infrastructures? Who, co who controls the skills infrastructures that are needed to build frontier models, right? Who, who, who's, who's, at, who's in the driver's seat there? And right now, you've got very large tech companies, right, that control data infrastructure, that control compute infrastructure, that control skills infrastructure, and we need, to, we need to be really aware of that, right? Because on the one side, you've got private interests controlling what will essentially become critical infrastructure. On the other side, you have the technology itself functioning as a public utility, right? That, that disconnect there is something which is, the, the, I think, the central problem of our generation in this technology. How do we claw back control over this very consequential set of critical technologies so that it, it does serve the social good and the public interest uh, in, in ways that it pr probably doesn't right now. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for the, the raising the various um, very good comments. And I, I also would like to um, add uh, or maybe ask another round of question uh, about uh, what you've discussed. So I, I think uh, having these multiple layers uh, to, to, to make the society re resilient uh, is really important, but on, on the other side, uh, it's, you know, very, uh, I actually throw away the 2G smartphone, so I actually <laughs> don't have the, the <laughs> like a network. H however, it's really, you know, uh, uh, has, a, it's, uh, has a lot of cost, you know, to create this multiple layer. And uh, if, uh, as, as David mentioned, that uh, if the AI system is becoming the public, uh, uh, to, to the infrastructure, and uh, it's somehow becoming very difficult to who to take the responsibility. And actually, this was actually, um, starting point of the discussion of even though the big platform or the big tech company uh, currently like uh, the foundation who provides the foundation model uh, talking about uh, the code of conduct or the responsibility but uh, whenever w when when the systems uh, go going very uh, you know becoming the infrastructure and also um, go beyond one, one company or the one organization. Uh, I was talking with the, the, comp the, the people from the company and they said they, they can't take the responsibility. They, 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 you know, it's, it's beyond their responsibility and uh, somehow the governmental discussion should be needed or maybe the global discussion should be needed. And uh, I, I think uh, so the, the considering about the responsibility and the cost and uh, uh, the, the what the individual can uh, do as a, as a, you know, as y y like you said about the, to, to be aware of the, ins uh, to, the, the uh, to, to cope with these issues is really important. But the, uh, so this might be uh, uh, the question for myself, for my, my side is that the what should be the, the government or maybe the individual sh uh, should take uh, to, for, for the next step, or maybe what what can we what kind of uh, systems or maybe structures uh, uh, should be discussed, and uh, 
uh, for example, th this is IGF forum, so a lot of multi-stakeholder discussion, and uh, not only the, the company, but also the government, and also the academic people are coming. So I think this is the place to discuss this kind of you know, system of systems, the AI becoming the network or the infrastructure. So uh, I think uh, some of the answers are kind of fragmentary uh, came out from your discussion, but uh, I would like to uh, uh, maybe uh, ask you again that uh, what should, uh, who, who uh, what kind of stakeholders should take uh, to cope with this uh, situation and to become make the society more resilient uh, from today? Wow. So the first thing is we need to demystify uh, the internet and AI. I'll give you an example. If you buy a Tesla, every time you do a, a software upgrade, which uh, the company actually does it for you, you sit in the car and, oops, that's a new OS, the company can take features that you actually paid for when you bought the car. Apple used to have radio on iTunes, and then a new OS came, and radio was gone. And there were thousands of people that were like, we want radio back in iTunes. Ah, sorry, Apple has taken it. This does not exist when you go to a department store and you buy a pair of trousers. Levi's doesn't come to your house and steals the trousers and leaves. So why do we allow it? And it's because the tech industry has hypnotized governments to believe that, so well, the internet and software is something else, but it's not. And AI is exactly the same. AI should come to us safe because she should be trained, developed, tested, and commercialized safe, safe for humans to use. But unfortunately, some rogue companies have put AI in the world in unsafe ways. And this is the action that we need to take right now. It requires to be brave. It requires to have a solid foundation in what you think should be done for the goodness of society. And sometimes that is really hard to negotiate. But we, the people, we, the people using products, need to get smart and need to demand what we believe we deserve. Because the collective has more power than any government trying to create regulations. The people move faster. When, when the internet was a baby and we were in Europe trying to access American websites, we all lied and pretended we had US addresses so that we could use Pandora music. <laughs> and then technology advanced and they all found out our IP address. And that was the end of that. The people always find a way, like water always finds a way. And what we're trying to do today is, for the first time, governments are listening listening to what people are really requesting and their needs. And this is the perfect moment in which governments and the people can together create what is it that we need. This regulation, these principles, this code of conduct, do we need to train people to be savvy and uh, AI literate and empower them with, this is, what, this is what you should be careful with or not. And this is a first for all of us. I sleep better at night now than in 2001 when I first went to Brussels because the EU was asking us, the scientists, what is Web 2.0? And I had to explain the internet as if I was coming from a new galaxy. So it's a m precious moment in which academics, researchers, my colleagues here, governments, companies that really want to create AI for good, we are all on the same page. 
and we have a blank page to create that new society, that new regulation, that new future in which finally things are going to be focusing on the people. Sorry, I sound like I'm running for elections, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that is what human-centric means, caring for people. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I do think that there is a moment right now when civil society, that is in this, particularly in this, in this place where we talk about multi-stakeholder efforts coming together to say what good looks like and appreciating there can be very different um, context within which that might be defined and creating mechanisms whereby we can better understand how accountable the technology is to that definition and how we can measure and monitor uh, and support the protection of uh, our societies, the resilience of our societies. Um, I've been thinking about our conversation and I, I do want to say one thing and that is the reason why I um, took on the role as CEO of Partnership on AI is because I do fundamentally believe in the power of this technology. And we are already seeing the ways in which um, even generative AI is in fact supporting and driving greater inclusion in some workplaces and in some environments. And so I think there are all sorts of wonderful opportunities across sectors for this technology. And I think this is a moment for us to make sure that the technology is accountable, yes, to us as humans. I, maybe I'm not going to be politician-like in what I say, <laughs> but it's so fine. Um, oh, and uh, you can switch your smartphone from three, four, three to 2G, by the way. So you don't need your old ones. Yeah, you, you, there's a, yeah, Pr <laughs> pro tip. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of the uh, question of, of how we got, like how we can sort of treat this govern, govern, governance moment, uh, I think we need to think globally and we need to think inclusive. Uh, we, the past six months, I mean, I think we were all sleeping less, right, with, with chat GPT and gen the kind of generative AI so-called revolution. And it's this kind of frenetic activity that's going on now, right, that, that, that everybody's kind of rushing to thinking, how do we govern these technologies? Well, I think it's, it's good because it's bringing out the importance of this conversation which should have been happening, I think, uh, maybe a couple of years ago. But one thing to remember here is the generative AI moment, the chat GPT revolution, whatever you want to call it, um, is a commercialization revolution, right? This is a moment of rapid commercialization that has raised a set of issues now that we're all kind of dealing with on, on, an, on a global international level. The problem with that is we're not thinking of this as a science and technology moment per se. We're thinking, ab we're thinking about it as a commercialization moment. And the difference is when we think of, for instance, the you know, global, um, potential global impacts of, of nuclear energy or, or nuclear weapons, or we think about the potential global impacts of, of climate change or, or the way that we're affect affecting the environment through our technologies, we're thinking of that in terms of governing the science and the innovation. And so you've got kind of int international bodies that are in charge of you know, regulating nu uh, nuclear energy or, or, or now increasingly trying to address climate change. We need to think of that, we need to think that way for AI, right? This shouldn't be about a bunch of uh, tech companies coming together and forming a voluntary agreement with one another. We should be thinking about forming a real um, international, multilateral inter international body that can think about the future of this technology and the governance of the technology through the lens of, of, of global public interest. Um, and I think we're, we, we aren't necessarily there yet, but I think we're taking steps in that direction. We're already in the Hiroshima process, we're talking about interoperability and alignment of standards. Um, there are talks now of, of, of a CERN for responsible AI, so thinking about forming a more international multilateral research body that looks into how to sort of you know build the right types of technologies and govern govern them and, and oversee them, um, and so I think that we're 
s incrementally and slowly moving towards that perspective that actually this is science, innovation, and technology that we need to treat as such, rather than thinking, oh, well, you know, you've got all of this commercial activity from these lang large language models, so how do we regulate big tech? It's not, this is, isn't a question about regulating tech companies. This is a question about governing consequential science and innovation for the, for the future of, of humanity in the biosphere. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think uh, we are running out of time. Uh, ho however, uh, what, what David actually uh, raised up is really important. So we need to tackle on this not only by the, the governmental level, but also the international level. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, the all the panelists are kind of engaged in this, this kind of international discussion. And uh, for example, the Global Partnership on AI, the Partnership on AI, and also the David is actually, uh, the, the, not the David, but the UK is actually organizing the AI Safety Summit next month. And uh, here, the IGF, and also uh, here in Japan, we actually have the Hiroshima AI process. And uh, the, the, the important thing is that to discuss all these kind of issues, uh, not separately, but uh, all together. And uh, I think we can, uh, you know, tackle onto these issues uh, within this AI governance framework. But uh, on the other side, uh, what uh, to be more inclusive? So this is a multi-stakeholder discussion. So I'm really happy to you know invite the Orihime pilots here today, and uh, also um, thank you for all, uh, all the, the comments here. And uh, we'll still uh, you know continue this discussion. And uh, well, I would like to uh, thank you all the panelists and the audiences. So thank you for coming to this session. Thank you.